So, uh, the, yeah, and people are joining and that's really great. Can, can we see joining. how many people join? Is there, is the number recorded somewhere? Um, uh, the number is changing every bit of seconds. You, you can um, see it. I can't, I can't see it. Is that correct? Uh, I, I can see, dear colleagues, uh, uh, I'm uh, really happy to greet you today uh, on behalf of Macmillan Ukraine. And I see that you are joining. And uh, if you are our regular attendee, you notice that we are on a different platform. Since uh, January, Macmillan is uh, delivering uh, our, we are delivering our webinars uh, via Zoom platform. So if you can find uh, the chat box, please uh, type in uh, that you are uh, hearing us and uh, where are you from and how you are feeling. I see that people are joining. But yeah, hello from Lviv, Tanya. Hello, hello. Chernivtsi, Ternopil. Oh, I'm so happy. Kiev, hello, hello. Poltava, Krivirik, Milnitsky, Irpin, again, Poltava, Dnipro, Kharkiv. I'm so happy that everybody is familiar with the Zoom and with the chat box and uh, people are joining and we have one more minute left before we start. It's Poltava and Zhitomir and Kharkiv. Lots, lots of people are joining us today. Ternopil region, I see. Milnitsky again, Kiev and Lutsk and uh, Chernigiv region. And again, Lviv and Changar. Uh, Changar is on the border. Um, uh, it's a very, very south of Ukraine. Uh, Chuguyev, Kharkiv, Novograd. Well, I we do have the whole geography of our country today. And it's like thirty seconds before we start. Okay, and I do see people whom I know personally mm -hmm. from Gymnasium 179 mm -hmm. Kiev. I'm glad to see you. And it's uh, Apostolove, Poltava, again Kharkiv, again Kherson, again Kiev. Well, it's a pleasure to see so many familiar names and places uh, where I've been personally and uh, I know people personally. It's a pleasure. So it's uh, 4 p.m. Kiev time. Uh, again, uh, hello, everyone. I'm Ina Nistaiter and I'm uh, from Macmillan Education Ukraine. And uh, today we're going to have an amazing session with a very special guest and a very special person. Um, it's Malcolm Mann, who is uh, not only the Macmillan author, but he's also our colleague. He teaches English. Uh, and uh, he uh, knows a lot about teaching teens and preparing for um, English language exams. And before I uh, give the floor to him, I would like to uh, assure that uh, you will receive your certificates uh, within the three days after today's webinar. So Malcolm, hello again. Glad to have you here with Ukrainian teachers. Hello, hello, Malcolm. Do you hear me? Me? Yes, yes, yes. So the floor is yours. Oh, right. Super. Thank you, Inna. So hello, everybody. Can everyone see me and hear me OK? I'm sure you can. But if you can, can you just write yes in the chat box? OK, brilliant. I'm seeing lots of yeses. That's fantastic. So, I mean, it's really wonderful to see so many people here today. I can't see exactly how many it is, um, but I believe we are several hundred people. So that's absolutely fantastic. Um, and thank you all very, very much for coming. Um, it's just gone, what, 4 p.m. in Kiev. Uh, and it's 4 p.m. where I am too. 
in Athens, in Greece. Um, so it's nearly the end of my working day, and I hope we're nearing the end of your working day too, so you can spend the evening relaxing. Um, now, I'm absolutely not here to talk about politics, um, except to say that my thoughts are with you all and Ukraine in these very troubling times. Um, I really hope everything works out okay. Um, but before we start, start properly, uh, a more personal note from me. Um, last week, I had COVID. I had the dreaded coronavirus. Um, thankfully, I wasn't too ill, uh, and I'm now negative, so I'm not contagious anymore. Um, but I'm still not completely better. Um, and I'm a little bit worried about how my voice is going to hold up over the next 40 minutes or so. And it will be only 40 minutes. It won't be an hour, I'm afraid, as I just don't think I can talk for that long. Um, I'm obviously going to do my best, um, but apologies in advance uh, if I have to stop to have a drink of water uh, or if I start coughing or sneezing or anything like that. Um, if it's really, really bad, I uh, might have to switch my camera off for a minute or two. Um, but please don't go anywhere if that happens. I'll be back um, as soon as I can. OK, now let's move on with the webinar. So the title of this webinar is Use of English, Effective and Engaging Revision of Grammar and Vocabulary Using Optimize. Now, I want to make it as practical as possible. So I'm going to spend the bulk of the time we have um, looking at practical activities that we can do with our students or that our students can make use of when they're revising outside of the classroom. Um, but I just want to spend the first five minutes or so before we move on to the practical things um, thinking about the idea of revision um, and what I think might be some of the important principles when it comes to revising, when it comes to revision. Now, don't feel you have to take lots of notes. I've got quite a few slides to put up um, over the next 40 minutes or so. You don't have to take lots of notes. In fact, you don't really have to take any notes um, because after the webinar, I imagine when you get your certificates over the next three days, um, but Inna can tell us in more detail at the end, um, we're going to send you a PDF with all of the slides from this presentation. So you can look at that in your own time and you don't have to take lots of notes right now. So revision. Um, let's start at the very beginning by thinking about what revision actually is. Now, to me, revision is reviewing. It's going over again information or material, maybe that's grammar or vocabulary, that has already been covered in class. Uh, it's looking again at work you've already done to check that you understand it, that you can remember it, um, to see which bits of it you understand and what you realize you don't understand. And then to consolidate that information or knowledge in your brain. Now, it might be because you have a test or an exam coming up, but it might not be because revision shouldn't just be for test or exam preparation. It's very important for test and exam preparation, but it's not just for that. I would argue it's an essential part of all learning. Now, people revise in different ways. Some people, for example, like to listen to music while they're revising. Other people need silence. Um, some people prefer working on their own. Others prefer working in pairs or in groups. So while I have my first sip of water, or in fact, sip of tea, um, let me just ask you, how do you like to revise as a student? Do you prefer silence or music? Not necessarily learning English when you're learning anything. Do you prefer silence or music? Do you prefer to revise on your own or in a group? Um, just write a very short response in the chat box and we'll take a look.
Right, there seem to be a lot more people saying silence than music. That's interesting. Several people saying alone, but then some people saying in a group. That's interesting. Music and in a group, mostly. So it's interesting, isn't it? It looks like the majority are for silence and alone. But it depends on the process, depends what you're revising. That's a good point. Right. In a group, silence. Oh, in a group, but silent. That's interesting. OK, let's move on. Now, for a few lucky people, um, we sometimes describe them as having a photographic memory. Uh, revision just involves quickly reading something. And by looking at it, they process the information and remember it. They are extremely lucky. Um, but that is a very, very small minority of people, a small minority of students. Um, for most people, certainly including me, just reading something isn't enough. And I think that that's a trap that a lot of students can fall into. If they're revising for a spelling test, for example, they might think that just looking at the words is enough preparation. Um, it usually isn't. So here are my basic principles for effective revision. Um, firstly, effective revision must be active. It has to be active. You have to be doing something. You're doing something to check your knowledge and consolidate your knowledge. You don't just passively look at your notes or stare at your student's book. Um, it can be done individually, but it doesn't have to be done individually. It can be done in pairs or in groups, and it can be done as a whole class activity. So you can do revision at home or in class, homework or in class, online and offline. And it doesn't have to be boring. And in fact, the more motivating and engaging it is, the more you're likely to remember the information that you're revising. Now, this might be through the use of humor or personalization or an interesting and engaging topic or a combination of those. And just coming back to the first point for a moment, I really want to emphasize the word active. You have to do something. Um, for me personally, I need to A, write things down, and then B, test myself or get someone to test me. That's the only way I'll know if I've actually learned it effectively or not. Um, so just as an example, a simple example, um, as I said, I live in Athens, in Greece, um, and my Greek's not very good, even though I've lived here a long time. So if I'm learning the Greek words for some colors, um, just looking at those words on a piece of paper isn't effective revision. For me, if I want to learn them properly and then revise them, I need to write them down myself and then practice saying them to get the pronunciation right. And then I need to test myself. So I might write them in two columns like this, and then I'll cover one of the columns and I'll test myself or I'll get someone to test me and then I'll uncover to check I'm right. So let me just do that quickly now. Uh, red is kokino, blue is ble, green is prasino, yellow is kitrino. Now orange, this is the trickiest one because the word for the fruit is stressed differently to the word for the color. And the color is portokali. Let me just check that. Yes, I've got the stress right, portokali. So I need to do that again and again and again until I'm absolutely sure that I know it without having to hesitate. Now let's think about optimize. Now in optimize, there's a large amount of revision and consolidation built into the course. Um, in the students' books, in the students' book, we have progress checks, 
Um, these are after every two units, and they revise and consolidate the key grammar and vocabulary from the previous two units. Of course, we have the workbook, and essentially the whole of the workbook, particularly in terms of use of English, the whole of the workbook is revision because no new language, no new grammar, no new vocabulary is presented. It's all revision and consolidation of work that's been done in the student's book. And also in the TRC, the Teacher's Resource Center, things like all the tests in the test generator. These are tests for the purposes of revision and consolidation of what's already been covered in the student's book. Now, I don't want to spend today though looking at those in detail because many of you, of course, use them every day already. So you know what's going on with all of those. So rather, I think it's more worthwhile to look at some other techniques and activities that we can use to help our students revise, to revise what they've already covered in class, particularly in terms of use of English. So tasks that focus on grammar, vocabulary, and lexicogrammar. But let me just introduce one other principle here. We don't often have time to produce completely new materials. So sometimes we have to reuse existing materials. So we'll be looking at how we can reuse things like progress checks, workbook material, students' book material, tests, etc., a second time for further revision. Now, I want to start with a few really simple things that we can do and then build up to some techniques and activities that are a little bit more advanced, a bit more demanding. Now, we've mentioned things like the progress checks, but we haven't talked yet about the reference material at the back of Optimize. And this is actually a really useful revision source. So do encourage your students to make use of it. For example, the unit by unit vocabulary reference section. This covers all the key vocabulary they're expected to learn broken down into different categories. So here, and this particular example is from Optimize B2 for unit one. We've got topic vocabulary, which is words connected with TV and cinema, phrasal verbs, collocations, and these are collocations with do, have, make, and take. Uh, and word formation. Now, a really simple but effective thing you can ask your students to do, and they can do this either in class or at home, is to personalize the example sentences. In other words, to come up with alternative example sentences that are about them, their lives, their friends, their family, their interests, their culture, et cetera. And this can be done orally or they can write them. So for each of these collocations, for example, they produce their own example sentences that are personal to them. Now, it could be that their personalized sentence is very, very similar to the example sentence in the book. So here for do nothing, their example sentence might be, I love doing nothing on Saturday mornings or it could be completely different. I did nothing yesterday morning and it was wonderful. So it might be very similar or it could be very different. It's personalized to them and their own experience. So that's vocabulary and we can do the same thing with the grammar reference section. We can ask students either in class or at home or both to come up with their own personalized example sentences. And in the grammar reference, all the example sentences are in italics. So they look at each italicized example sentence and come up, come up with their own personalized example. So for here for present continuous, past continuous, present perfect continuous, and past perfect continuous. Now, at this point, uh, I want to introduce one more principle. Sometimes you or they need to isolate or identify what needs to be revised. What we've looked at so far for the vocab reference 
it's obvious what needs to be revised. It's these collocations. And for the grammar, it's obvious. It's the present continuous and the past continuous, etc. But sometimes it isn't always completely obvious. Um, in this example, also from the grammar reference, there's a stage of checking that the students understand what the information is saying here. That all of these verbs aim to do, be able to do, afford to do, agree to do, appear to do, arrange to do, etc. That all of these verbs are followed by the full infinitive, the infinitive with to. But there are other verbs, admit, appreciate, etc., that are followed by the ing form. So admit doing, appreciate doing, etc. So first, you or the students have to identify what needs to be revised. And only when you've done that can the students produce their own personalized example sentences for each verb. Now, taking that idea a little bit further, um, the idea of identifying what needs to be revised. What about if we have a gap fill task like this one? Now, as a revision task, after the students have done the task in class and after you've been through it, so they know the answers, the first thing to do is to isolate what each gap is focusing on. And this is an activity in itself, and it's also an extremely important exam skill. Being able to analyze the words before and after a gap to answer the question, what's being tested here? And if we do that with this particular task, we look at the words before and after gap number one, and we recognize that what's being tested here is that you take part in an activity. And for number two, that something takes up a lot of time. We can also say takes a lot of time, but here takes up a lot of time. And for the third gap, it's testing two things. Sometimes with gap fill text, two things are being tested at the same time. The first one is that willing is followed by the full infinitive, willing to do something and also that it's make an effort or make the effort. So here, willing to make an effort. The fourth one, it's testing that students know you use an, not a, before an adjective or a noun that starts with a vowel sound. Five, it's testing the phrasal verb, hang out with someone. Six, the phrase, take your time. Seven, once again, it's testing two things important to do something, the full infinitive, and then do your best, not, for example, make your best. And then eight, it's testing the phrase, only a few. So once the students have isolated the vocabulary or the grammar or the lexico, lexico grammar, only then can they use it to come up with their own personalized example sentences. And similarly, for sentence transformations, for effective revision, it's important to identify, first of all, what's being tested. And in sentence transformations, there are usually two different things going on. So in this particular example, did you manage to finish the report on time, Carl? Asked Sarah. That's the first sentence. And then the second sentence, Sarah asked Carl if, and then we have the blank, the report on time, and then the keyword is succeeded, there's two different things going on. The first thing it's testing is manage to do from the first sentence and succeed in doing in the second sentence. And the other thing it's testing is direct speech. In the first sentence, it's direct speech. It's actually a question, it's question form. Did you manage to do something? And then in the second sentence, it's not direct speech, it's reported speech. And sentence transformations usually test two different things. So once you and all the students have isolated the vocabulary, the grammar, or the lexico grammar that's being tested, they can then use that to produce their own sentences. 
One sentence using manage to do, the second sentence using succeed in doing that's personalized to them, their lives, their interests, their family, etc. The first one using direct speech, the second one using reported speech. Now we'll come back to sentence transformations uh, and look at them in a bit more detail a little bit later on. But that's a few very simple tasks based on producing personalized example sentences. Now I want to think about some slightly more advanced ways that we can use existing material for the purposes of revision. And let's think about word formation tasks like this one. Now, once again, we're assuming this is revision. So we've already done this task with our students, perhaps a few weeks ago or a few months ago. And now we want to revise it. So they've seen it before and in their books, they probably have the answers written in. Now, one thing we can do is ask students individually or perhaps in pairs to produce eight sentences, each sentence including an answer from the word formation task. So here, for example, their first sentence must contain the word pleasure because that's the answer to number one. Their second sentence must contain the word appearance and so on. And once again, you might want to encourage them to personalize their sentences. Then we ask one student to choose one of their sentences, not necessarily the first one. It could be the sentence for gap number seven. So they choose one of their sentences. They don't say which one it is. And they write it on the board with a gap where the key answer word goes. So they write, for example, for example, my mum's a really blank singer. And they don't give a keyword. There's no keyword in this particular task because the other students then have to guess what word fits the gap. Can anybody guess which word fits the gap? If you can, type it into the chat box. What's the answer? Popular could fit, but the actual answer for number five is popularity. So popularity doesn't fit. So it's not popular. In, it's not impressed, but you're close. Impressive, very well done. Impressive is the answer. My mum's a really impressive sister because impressive is the only answer from the task that fits the gap. And this is even more fun if you make it a competition where after they've written their sentences individually or in pairs, you split them into two teams and each team gets a point if they get the correct word. So if they get the word impressive, they get a point. Now, another advantage of this task when the team are shouting out possible answers, so a team shouting out impressive or popular, they're speaking, they're not writing. And this is very important with word formation. And the pronunciation aspect of word formation is something that's lost if you just do word formation solely as a written task. Just in this task, for example, we've got please to pleasure, a pronunciation issue, popular to popularity, pronunciation issue, decide to decision, a uh, pronunciation issue. And these pronunciation issues in word formation might just be sound, so discuss to discussion, for example, uh, or they might be stress, photograph to photographer, or they might be a combination, photographer to photographic. Uh, so something else we can do is get our students to produce fun tongue twisters, each one including two or three key pronunciation differences from the words or the task that you want them to revise. So here, for example, we've got photographer, photograph, and photographic. 
we've got scientist and scientific, and we've got investigator and investigation. We put them all together, the students put them all together in their own individually produced tongue twister. And then we encourage the students to say them as quickly as possible with mouth, without making any mistakes. Now they can start off slowly. Freddie, the photographer, took fancy photographs of scientists and investigators doing scientific investigations with photographic paper. And then we get them to speed up as fast and as fast as they can. That's really not easy, but it's lots of fun and it's very good practice. Freddie, the photographer, took fancy photographs of scientists and investigators doing scientific investigations with photographic paper. Not easy, but lots of fun and very good practice. Now, something else that we can do with word formation tasks um, that students have seen and done before is give them the task again, but this time without the keywords. Now, obviously they have to have their books closed for this because if their books are open, they've got the keywords, they've got the answers there. So you get them to close their books, you give them this paragraph again without maybe a photocopy or on the board without the keywords. You remind them that they've seen it before. And then firstly, ask them to see if they can remember or guess or work out what the keywords in bold were. Not the answers, the keywords in bold. That's the first task. And then when they've got the keywords, then you can quickly check orally that they know how to make the actual forms that fill the gap. And for slightly weaker students, you might want to do this alternative instead. You give them the keywords in a different order. So appear, decide, you might want to put them in alphabetical order like here, appear, decide, end, etc. You give them in a different order and they have to match as the first stage, each keyword with a gap. And when they've matched each keyword with a gap, then orally you check that they can form the correct word to fill the gap. And once again, the advantage of orally is that it's also focusing on pronunciation. Now, so far, most of the tasks we've been thinking about, word formation, gap fill, um, have been at the text level. I want to think now about some tasks which present language just at the sentence level. Now, I'm going to focus on sentence transformations for most of my examples, um, but we can do a similar thing with most grammar or vocabulary tasks that work at the sentence level. Now, once again, for all of this, we're assuming this is revision. So the students have done this sentence, this, sorry, the students have done this sentence transformation task perhaps a few weeks or a few months before, and they probably have the answers written in their book. Now, this particular example, uh, this is a sentence transformation task from an optimized, I think it's B2 progress check. Now, I want to come back to an idea uh, I mentioned at the beginning, uh, the idea of engaging the students, of motivating them, of doing something fun and interesting, because uh, there's very little interesting about sentence transformations. Um, in fact, one of the only interesting things about sentence transformations is how uninteresting, how boring they are. Um, and I think the reason for that is individually, they have absolutely no relation to the real world. And they provide no context at all. Look at number five here, for example. Um, try not to get angry when you speak to Isabel. Well, who's Isabel? What are you going to talk to her about? Why should you try not to get angry? We have absolutely no idea at all. There is no context. So one thing we can do with our students um, for the purposes of revision, and which really engages our students is get them to use their imagination to come up with a context. A context that creates a story, a short story, a narrative where the sentence is given a context. 
So let's take this example. Here's our sentence transformation. Jeff started work here four years ago. That's the first sentence. And then the second sentence, obviously the answer is Jeff has been working here for four years. So they get Jeff and the gap and then four years and then the word working. Now, in itself, there is no context whatsoever. What we're going to do is encourage our students to create a realistic scenario. And to do that, <clears throat> excuse me, they're going to ask key questions about people. Who's Jeff? And places, where is here? And of course, if Jeff started, if Jeff started work here and you're the person talking, who are you? Are you a Ukrainian teenager? Probably not. So you're probably gonna to have to create an identity for yourself. You're probably an adult who works in a place with Jeff. And you might have to ask questions about time. So people, places, and time. And we're going to encourage our students to use their imagination to produce as much detail as possible. Now, what I suggest is that we ask them to make notes, first of all, either individually or in pairs, and then they use their notes to present their little story orally. And the great thing about this is that every student's or every pair's scenario is gonna be different, is gonna be unique. So what kind of notes do I mean? These are the kind of notes I mean. So me, I work for a local newspaper and I'll give it a name, the Plymouth Times. I'm a journalist, I do interviews. I've used my imagination to come up with this. I often need photos too. Jeff is a photographer. He started four years ago. We work together a lot. So those are my notes. That's me using my imagination to come up with the scenario. And then I use my notes to actually tell the whole story. I work for a local newspaper called the Plymouth Times. I'm a journalist there, so I spend much of my day going around Plymouth interviewing people. We often need to take photos of the people, of in people I interview, so a photographer usually comes with me. The photographer I mainly work with is called Jeff. He's very good and we get on very well. Jeff started work here four years ago, there's our sentence. And since then, we've worked together hundreds of times. And all of the students in class will have a completely different story. And then of course, we've got the second sentence. Jeff has been working here for four years. So the students can then repeat their scenarios, their stories, using the new second sentence instead. And this time, perhaps, depending on how strong the class is, perhaps they can't look at their notes. Or you get another student to tell the same story, but using the second sentence. And of course, because the grammar of the second sentence is slightly different, they might need to make other changes too. So in the first time we told the story, if it was Jeff started work here four years ago, and since then we've worked together, but this time we need to make a change. Jeff has been working here for four years, so we've worked together. There might be other grammatical changes too. And this is really engaging for our students. It really connects them they cr to create a context for these sentences that have no context whatsoever. But that's each individual sentence. Let's take it one step further. Is there any way we could get our students to connect all of the sentences within a sentence transformation task? Now, I think there is, and I think this is lots of fun. We get students to come up with a narrative that connects all the sentences. Now, in the previous example, where it was just one sentence, we said, let's make the scenario realistic. Here, I think, we should encourage our students to create a scenario that can be bizarre or surreal. It doesn't always have to be sensible and logical because one, that makes it easier to connect the sentences. And secondly, the more interesting and entertaining, the more bizarre it is, the more interesting and entertaining it is. Now, students can use the sentences, I would say, in any order. They don't need to follow the order of the task. But once again, they make notes first, 
then they use their notes to present orally. And once again, the great thing about this is that every student or every pair's scenario will be different or unique. Now, if we were in the same room, um, I would actually ask you to do this task. I will give you five, at least five minutes to make notes, to take these seven sentence transformations and come up, use your imagination to come up with a scenario where these sentences can be connected. Uh, because you're not in the same room um, as me, I'm not gonna ask you to do that, but just take while I have a sip of tea, and you don't have to write anything in the chat box, but just take a minute or two minutes to start thinking, how could you possibly connect these seven sentences in a scenario? Don't, you don't have to write anything down. Don't write anything in the chat box. Just start to think, how could I connect these seven sentences while well, I have a cup of tea? <clears throat> Just have a think about it. Now, remember, they don't have to be in the same order as here. Now, I hope and imagine that you're thinking, well, it's not easy. I'm really going to have to use my imagination here, but it can be done and it can be done. Uh, I've made my notes, uh, so I'm actually going to do this task. I'm not going to make you do this task. So I've made my notes, and I'm now going to tell you my scenario where I'm going to connect all of these sentences. Um, actually, I am going to start with the first one as number one. I don't have to, but I am going to. And as I read through my story, I want you to notice which sentences I'm using when. Okay, here we go. <clears throat> So at our school, I'm, I'm now a student. I'm pretending that I'm a student. So at our school, school prizes are given out <clears throat> at the end of each year, on the last day of the summer term. They're prizes for doing well in subjects and also sport. A few hours before the prize giving ceremony, we have the annual sports day, which is basically lots of different athletic events. This year, my friend Richard created a problem because he didn't turn up for the 100 meters race. The problem was that he hadn't seen the notice saying he was in it because his hair is so long, it covers his face. This is the bizarre bit. It is six months since Richard went to the barbers for a haircut. So there was a delay at the start while we found Richard. And of course, the start of the second race was delayed because the first race finished late. So prize giving started late too, and people started getting annoyed because it was quite cold. My friend Lynn was freezing. Luckily, her best friend Hannah was happy to lend Lynn a jacket. I sat next to my brother John. John went to the cinema by himself yesterday afternoon, so he told me all about it. My brother didn't used to be so confident, so it's great that he can now go to the cinema on his own. After the prize giving, the school orchestra gave a concert. It was very good, but my friend Kate, who was going to do a violin solo, couldn't be there because she was ill. Kate regrets missing the concert, but when you're ill, you're ill. One, four, three, seven, two, five, six. Very good, Irina, absolutely. So there we go. That's how I managed to connect the sentences. It is possible, but every student's scenario will be completely different. And that's what makes this task so much fun. Um, but it's also a really, really effective um, revision technique. Now, just a couple of uh, other quick things before we finish uh, on sentence transformations. Uh, similarly to word, forma word formation, we can do a task with no keyword. Um, so we give students, we get them to close their books because they've seen this in their books, and we give this to them again. 
and we give our students the two sentences without the keywords and they brainstorm possible keywords that might be used to fill the gaps. Or, as we did with word formation, we separate out the keywords and rearrange the order. And the students then have to work out which keyword might go with each sentence. We might just give them the first sentence or we might just give them both sentences. And um, this is quite an interesting one. Um, we give students an incorrect answer sentence. And so the students have to find at least one grammatical or lexical or information error in the second sentence. So here, James would only speak to the head of department alone. James demanded on speaking to the head of department alone. That's the answer, but it contains a mistake. Can anyone, now the key word is on. Can anyone see what the mistake is? What's the mistake? If you can see the mistake, type into the chat box. The key word is on. Yes, absolutely. It shouldn't be demanded. It should be insisted. James insisted on speaking to the head of department. So we give our students the mistake and they then have to correct it. And that's also a very, very good task for revising sentence transformations. Uh, and the final one I want to focus as I'm past my 40 minutes, um, we give students the answer key, but not the sentences. And they then produce their own first sentence and the beginning and end of the second sentence. So here, for example, for number 27, the answer key is accused Paul or accused him or accused her because with answer keys for, for sentence transformations, obviously they often have multiple answers. So accused Paul, accused him, accused her of taking or of eating or of having taken or of having eaten. There's all those possible answers. We give them the answer and then the students either individually or in pairs come up with their own first sentence and the beginning and end of the second sentence. So for example, you took the last piece of chocolate, Hannah said to Paul, that's the first sentence. The key word is accused. And then they write Hannah and the last piece of chocolate because then the answer is a Hannah accused Paul or him or her of taking or of eating or of having taken or of having eaten the last piece of chocolate. And once again, every student's individual pair's sentences first sentence and second sentence will be different. Um, so I am out of time. Um, that's all I want to say really. Um, I hope that's given you some ideas to think about um, and that you'll try some of these activities with your students. Um, did you, do you think you will try some of these with your students? Uh, if you do, just quickly type into the chat box which ones you think you might use. Oh, well, that's good news. Tanya says, definitely. I hope you're not just being polite. I'm sure you're not. Okay, brilliant. So when you get the PDF, uh, don't forget to have a look again at the PDF. Uh, so you've got all the tasks in the PDF uh, and you can decide when you can use them as revision with your students. Okay, that's all from me. I'm handing back to Inna. Malcolm, thank you very much. Uh, really, uh, your uh, rather short talk, uh, I wish it was uh, longer, but I do understand. Uh, uh, I, I'm ready to listen to you for hours. Uh, oh, and, thank uh, you very in, much. Uh, yeah, and uh, uh, even though I'm a really experienced teacher, I found uh, plenty of ideas for lessons for uh, revision lessons for different ages because of course telling the story and creating scenarios uh, the uh, this is a challenging task but with b1 levels but i believe that b1 level students are able to do this not only i think b2 they can levels. certainly have a they can certainly have a go and i think they will enjoy having a go and B, uh, B2, absolutely. 
But B1, they, they, they might keep it simple, but that's fine. You are always uh, full of very creative ideas, very useful Good. and very simple, actually, simple to uh, do. Absolutely. Simple is important. We don't have time for complicated. Uh, yeah, uh, dear colleagues, uh, I would like to remind you that uh, you will receive a certificate within three days starting from today and in another letter from uh, your local representative, uh, whom I'm sure you are uh, familiar with, uh, you will receive another letter with the PDF of this presentation so that you can use the ideas in your uh, everyday work, uh, in may maybe in your next lesson. Malcolm, I really thank you. Thank you for agreeing to uh, talk to our teachers. Thank you for agreeing to share your ideas. Uh, we do love uh, the uh, things you do. And uh, it is uh, not only my belief, uh, and not because only I work uh, for Macmillan Education, I uh, was a teacher who taught uh, using your course books. And many of people here today, they uh, remember and they used and taught with laser. And, laser, uh, yes. Yeah. And destination is still the top exam uh, revision uh, book. Fantastic. Destination is extremely uh, popular in our country and optimized uh, with its up-to-date uh, resources, uh, especially in this pandemic times when many teachers are teaching online. Uh, it is a real treasure. And I do know Good. that uh, we have uh, here today teachers who uh, teach with Optimize for a couple of years and they enjoy it. I'm very glad to hear that. Uh, thank you very much, dear colleagues, for uh, finding time, for spending this time uh, with uh, Macmillan Education Absolutely. Ukraine and our special guest uh, and uh, author, Mal Kalman, and uh, see you during our next uh, webinars. See you, take care, stay healthy. And goodbye from me again. Yeah. Goodbye, goodbye.